Okay, now it's uh, your turn with questions. Um, we have a number of uh, questions on the Big Brother uh, side of this and whether or not there's a government intrusion and, and a public utility intrusion into our homes. Uh, one question, uh, the basic foundation of our country is the assumption that man is fit to govern himself rather than be ruled by dictators. Does this smart meter program operate on the first assumption or the latter? Uh, another, I'm a consumer, sell me your product and don't tell me how to use it. Uh, there's another component to the smart uh, uh, energy use, and that is that Whirlpool and uh, GE are now developing smart appliances, and these smart appliances are also hooked up to the grid, and um, they will basically, it's a, I, I believe something you opt into. Now at some point it could be something you don't have any choice with, but at the moment it's something that you opt into and you're allowed to uh, uh, allow, uh, give them permission through the grid to turn off your your dryer during certain times or at least put it on low energy use during certain times of the day or however else they would make it more energy efficient. Do, uh, who wants to take a crack at uh, the big government component, in particular the smart appliances and other, other smart components that uh, uh, are part of it? Well, I was, I was speaking on the phone with Heather last night and she said, I, I don't really want my refrigerator talking about me behind my back. <laughs> and, you know, it's true. When you think about it, uh, if every appliance in your house is micro shift and is communicating wirelessly with your smart meter, and that data is being relayed every four seconds to data collector units, which send that, that, that data to a, a cell phone tower, which send it to massive uh, data centers that will process and analyze that data. That is tremendously valuable information for uh, corporations, for marketers. Uh, imagine if you, um, you, know, you get up in the middle of the night very frequently and you turn, off, turn on the lights when you do that. Well, corporations are going to be able to know, that your utility company is going to be able to know that you possibly have a urinary disorder. And uh, possibly, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry might want to market particular drugs to you through your Gmail account. I mean, this is the kind of thing that we're looking at. And there are insufficient protections uh, currently uh, on that data. You know, the utilities say, oh, your, your data is completely safe. But if you look at the actual uh, regulations in place, it is wholly insufficient. And I think people should be very alarmed about that aspect of the smart meter program. Could I also say something? In my book, I have an email that came from a lady in Switzerland. She said she had just moved to her home there, and she turned on her washing machine at noon. It turned itself off five minutes later and came back on at three in the afternoon. Her Switzerland already had the smart meters speaking to the smart appliances, telling them what they could do and what they could not do. And this was the peak time of day, so the smart appliance just was turned off. And I think that's just a little too much, big brother. What if we need those clothes washed at that time of day and we're willing to pay more money for it? This is just too much control of our lives. And that's already happening. It, it definitely is instructive when the federal government and various states are taking a look now after the rollout of about 15 million mandated install, installed smart meters at privacy issues. And so clearly the cart was put before the horse. Um, and, and this really gets to the heart of the question, that consumers were never consulted, that they were never prioritized, that the promise of consumer efficiencies was never about consumers. It was about utility operating efficiencies. And that has been the priority of the policy. Now, getting to the promise of technology, I, I think we can go throughout history. Uh, I, I'm a, uh, my office is a block away from the Library of Congress, and I love going in and, and getting access to old archived materials. And I've read newspaper accounts from when the telephone was first being uh, rolled out in, in large numbers in many U.S. cities. And there were articles talking about how it was going to permanently disrupt the sense of community in many towns. And in some ways, I'm sure it did, as any uh, advance in technology. But it also revolutionized communication. There's no question that smart meters and smart appliances, if installed in active collaboration and with active consent of families, can provide promise in terms of 
making a family's energy usage in their home far more efficient. But the key is consent, not a mandate that does not consult with if whether or not this makes sense for this family or whether or not a family might have health effects. But I have definitely talked to a lot of people that, have, that love having their programmable smart meter talk to their appliances and they're able to save money, but it's not for everyone. And I definitely do not want government making that decision at a control room hundreds of miles away. So it's about owning and controlling that technology. I want to see consumers be empowered to have access because the promise of technology I think is real. And I think you, the United States is losing competitive advantage on a number of things, but it cannot be mandated in the way that smart meters were done, particularly in California. Well, one thing to keep in mind along with, with your, your thoughts is that one neighbor who is sensitive is going to be affected by the meters around them in, in multiple ways. Uh, wireless radiation through the air, wireless radiation through the electrical wiring, radiation that will come through um, any uh, metallic pipe, gas line, water line, and so on that interconnects you. So we are very interconnected as a community with these. And if you, if, I, I think we're going to face a, a, an issue here where communities need to make decisions about whether or not they want wireless at all because it affects everyone in those communities, up and down the blocks. So it isn't everyone's individual choice. What you choose may affect your neighbor. From my perspective, uh, the system's rigged against the ordinary people just like yourselves. Uh, we have the PUC who is not elected. It's a uh, appointed body uh, that's beholden, in my opinion, to uh, special interest groups. Uh, President Peavy is a former uh, chief executive uh, of Edison uh, making decisions for utility companies, and uh, that to me is a, a conflict of interest to say the least. Uh, it is a fundamental concern about big government and choice, as I uh, alluded to in my opening remarks, whether you look at the United States Constitution and, and uh, the Constitution which prohibits the commandeering and the requiring of states uh, to uh, implement certain requirements uh, that the Fed uh, sees uh, fit, or if you want to resort to the California Constitution, Article 1, Section 1, which uh, states that uh, uh, there is a declaration of rights that we have as people in California and that we are to be free and independent with these inalienable rights. And among these are enjoying and defending life, liberty, and acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining safety, happiness, and privacy. This uh, smart meter deployment and technology stretches that envelope. You'll look at your uh, hazard insurance and homeowner's insurance uh, policy. You'll see that that policy explicitly uh, precludes any coverage with uh, RF uh, emissions and then which uh, would fall with under the auspice of the installation of smart meters. You know, as it's been alluded by other panelists here this evening, we have a choice whether we want to put a cell phone to our ear. We don't know if it's safe or not. It's still inconclusive. We have a choice if we want to microwave our food, use a garage door open or remote control for our TVs or use uh, wireless routers. Uh, but uh, with smart meters and the PUC, uh, mandate, uh, which is coming from them, make no mistake, uh, we have no choice. And that's what this issue is about for me at the most fundamental level. Let me tell you what I'm afraid of and let me tell you what I think can be done. What I'm afraid of is, you know, we're at the point where we are 80 to 90 percent in the state of having smart meters installed, okay? We have $5 billion of your money and my money invested in this. I'm worried, I'm worried that we have fought the fight and lost when it comes to the installation of smart meters. That's what I'm worried about. I do see some opening in terms of the PUC bowing to pressure in Northern California on uh, the fact that um, they're now asking PG&E to uh, propose an opt-out. We do think that uh, it, it's way too expensive what they're proposing and that it should be far more affordable. 
I will tell you this, though. You need to understand that there have been very few complaints about smart meters from Southern California. I'm going to give you an example at turn. Um, I asked folks before coming here who work in my office, because we have a consumer hotline, um, what the comparison was. And I'm, I'm just saying that, that at turn, you know, we ha we've had about 1,400 complaints um, from PG&E customers about smart meters. We've had about 52 from Edison customers. I'm just giving you numbers here, okay? If you go to the CP CPC also has a division that deals with uh, public complaints. They have similar numbers where the numbers from outside of PG&E are actually very small. And I'm saying that so that you understand why the, the, the CPUC has asked PG&E to consider an opt-out, and they have not asked Southern California Edison to consider an opt-out. I think that's just a fact. It has to do with the number of people that have complained. So it really does have to do, uh, complaints do make a difference is what I'm trying to say from where I sit. Thank you. There's a number of uh, questions about the cost and what it actually means to the consumer. Uh, and what about all these meter readers that are no longer going to be necessary? And if, and if they're not necessary, why is there not savings then passed on to the consumers? Well, the, because the, when, when we look at it, and in our white paper we go into this, the average cost of the smart meter overwhelms even the operational efficiencies that the utility realizes in savings from being able to, to lay off or um, relocate the meter readers and all of the trucks that have to roll out to uh, connect or disconnect service. And, and that's our primary, public citizens' primary issue with smart meters is they have been sold to us as a means for consumers to have more control over their energy usage to use energy more smartly and they will save money and when we look at the at the cost of the installation of the smart meter and what it actually allows the average family to do they're not going to realize savings in excess of the cost of the meter and so for us that is the primary thing that we're looking at is this policy saving people money that public citizen, we concluded, no, it isn't, and therefore we're not going to support mandatory smart meter policies. And that's what we've communicated to the federal government. That's what we've commi uh, communicated to the Obama administration, that we want to see cost-effective investments that save households money. Smart meters ain't doing it. I just want to point out that the, the way that utility companies are functioning in California right now are mechanisms to take ratepayer uh, money, your, my money and your money that we pay on our, on our utility bills, and transfer that money to shareholder profits. And it doesn't serve uh, efficiency. It doesn't serve affordability. I mean, utilities want to have their cake and eat it too. For example, I mean, we were looking at a situation where they uh, uh, they got this billion, multiple billions of dollars in rate increases to pay for the smart meter program approved at the PUC. Now when uh, residents of California raise their voice and say, no, you never asked us whether we wanted these things, you never even let us know. I mean, it's pretty easy to take out a, a full page ad in a newspaper and say, hey, this is coming, you know, what do you think? But they didn't do that, and I think there's a good reason for that. Uh, so now that we say, well, we don't want these things, they don't save us money, they don't save energy, they don't uh, solve climate change, they may actually exacerbate it, um, they're making people sick and violating our privacy, what the hell? Uh, they say, well, we're going to charge you hundreds of dollars to opt out, in addition to the amount of money that you're already spending on this program. And to make matters worse, this opt out is not really an opt-out because you'll still get a smart meter but you just have to trust your utility in this case PG&E to switch off the RF transmitter uh, in the meter and and there's a lot of evidence that the, the the health impacts that people are suffering 
are, are, are not only just the RF transmitter, they come from dirty electricity, as Cindy mentioned, from the switching mode power supply. So we're trying to, uh, for, there's, there's a response trying to be made for, for a problem that we don't even under, quite understand. We need to get the best experts up there to figure out what's happening and how we can uh, solve this problem. And right now, the utilities are in the driving seat. They are driving the PUC, they are in control of the Public Utilities Commission, and the public is losing out. When uh, PG&E came before our board uh, about two months ago, they presented that uh, in their deployment of close to seven million uh, smart meters uh, that uh, thus far they are realizing a savings for consumers and ratepayers in the range of 12 to 20 percent. I ask that representative, uh, since now that you have uh, embarked upon this installation of the meters, you should have some sub substantive data to back up or substantiate that claim. I've asked them three times and still have yet to receive that information. I find myself as I become more engaged in trying to understand the pg and &E culture and what I find is very interesting. One of the board members that I recruited to run is a retired PG&E. Uh, and uh, she's finding herself abstaining from a number of issues right now because of conflict of interest and uh, uh, with her pension and also trying to contract out with green energy projects. But uh, what, what I'm seeing is a culture where you have uh, uh, their former CEO who has now resigned. Uh, I think the gas line expo explosion and uh, not being really informed about their infrastructure and not being forthcoming with information and data was enough for the CPUC to say that uh, we have some problems here. Uh, that coupled with a poor PR uh, approach to the smart meter issue is indicative and reflective of why he needed to go. Uh, what saddens me is uh, 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 the motives that are uh, couched as the reason for smart meters are that they're in the interest of the consumer so you can go online and monitor your usage. Well, the reality is most people don't uh, have computer access in my district. And uh, you can see studies such in the state of Connecticut where they have close to 2,000 homes that were surveyed with smart meters and uh, businesses. And the result of that report was that there was no deterrence or no uh, uh, usage downturn with the installation of smart meters, so it debunks that whole theory. The motive is about profit, and that is uh, evident with uh, uh, the CEO who just resigned, who uh, we paid for his $35 million parachute. Um, you know, they say that possession is nine tenths of the law, and in this case, that means that it's much harder to get smart meters out once they're put in, right? Okay, that's possession is nine-tenths of the law. It's much easier to prevent them from putting it in before they get them in in the first place. I'm bringing this up because actually there's a unique situation down here in Southern California that's very different from Northern California. In Northern California, we have PG&E, as they do in San Diego, SDG&E, that are combined utilities. So you've got a situation where you've got the electric and the gas smart meters going in at the same time. You don't have that here, right? Edison's electric only. You've got SoCal Gas, right? And SoCal Gas had a completely separate smart meter application um, that was even less cost effective, even had less. And in fact, it was so poorly designed, their whole proposal, that for the first time, the administrative law judge who ruled on the case, ruled against the smart meters. This is the first time in California they said there is no way that you can spend a billion dollars to lose 1,000 meter reader jobs and under the best of circumstances, consumers would recover the investment in 30 years under the best of circumstances, okay? And so the ALJ actually ruled against it. And President Peavy um, uh, overruled it, got the commissioners to overrule it. Now, the gas smart meters have not gone in. And so that's a window of opportunity where um, preventing and joining the campaign to stop SoCal Gas from installing the gas smart meters is a very concrete thing that can be done. Uh, uh, Turn has appealed the decision. Um, and we're hoping that with some new commissioners that have recently joined, they will reverse on appeal 
that decision. So that's, I just want to make you aware that there's a, actually a distinction between the, uh, the Edison smart meters and the SoCal gas smart meters. While the Edison smart meters are 70, 80 percent installed, the SoCal gas smart meters really haven't started yet. So I just want you to be aware of that. Uh, we have uh, a number of questions on how I can opt out. Um, there's probably half the questions are on, on that particular issue. And uh, the concern is, from a private property rights standpoint, can we uh, figure out how to uh, have that right in Santa Barbara? If Southern California Edison had sent someone here tonight, every one of us would have asked that person, what's the phone number? Well, let's all call Southern California Edison tomorrow, corporate office, and ask, what is that phone number? You know, not to be facetious, uh, people in PG&E land have to call every single week. There is a phone number for them. There is a list. Josh knows a lot about it. But it's, it's, it's persistence as well, and it doesn't always work. So it is not something you do and check off the list. But we need the phone number. And, and you know, don't give up your power to a utility. This is your home. If they want to put something that there's substantial evidence that it causes health damage on your home, you don't have to let them. I mean, uh, the utilities have an easement to go and read your meter and to determine what the reading is in order to bill you. They do not have any legal right to install a radiating device on your home that may impact your health. And what you can do is, you know, what many people have done in Northern California is to lock up their meter uh, to make it physically impossible to remove your analog meter and to install a smart meter. Uh, and you can, and more importantly, you can spread the word to your neighbors, declare a smart meter free zone in your neighborhood, and a, we and a Wellington watch. Uh, Wellington is Energy is the company who are installing them. Corex here, uh, uh, a Corex watch in, in Santa Barbara, and, and, and make sure that your neighbors know what the risks are, what these people look like, no, make sure that everyone knows that they have a right to say no, and if necessary, uh, call the police if they refuse to get off your property. If you go to stopsmartmeters.org, there's uh, uh, several photos right now, actually, on one on the front page of people who've uh, constructed a, a, a shed around their meters. Some people use locks and chains. There are various uh, methods in order to do that. On the oh, we'll uh, table totally back know. in the back, there is a little yellow form also that shows a picture of the, the lock that you can put on it. I have one on mine. I also have a fence around my meter, and it is being watched by two pug dogs. <laughs> and, when, and, and my husband and I also have a sign where we signed our, our name. We say, Dear pg and &E, we refuse to allow you to install a smart meter. We dated it and signed it. And a, a man from the Wellington truck came to our home just as I was going out the garage and I noticed him, and I said, oh, I know who you are, and I know why you're here. And he said, you do? I said, yes, you want to give me a smart meter, don't you? And he said, yes, would you show me where your meter is? Well, it's just around the corner, but if you'll notice, it has a fence around it without a gate, and two dogs watching it. It has a belt on it, and it has a note saying, we refuse to allow you to install this. When you see that note, legally, you cannot install a smart meter. Is that correct? And he said, yes, that's correct. So he turned to leave, and then he noticed this was when I was going off to get my resolution copied for the, the Central Committee that evening. He noticed my resolution. He said, you feel really strongly about this, don't you? I said, yes, we are going to fight this in every way we can. So you don't have to give in. Even though they tell you, well, you're just going to have to go without electricity. You're going to have to go off the grid. Let them know the federal law. They are supposed to allow you a choice. This was last October. We still are getting our electricity. There's still a meter reader that comes and reads our meter. So you have rights, and you need to stand up for them. And one other thing I forgot to mention, there is such a thing as the Tenth Amendment right that a state has rights over their people that are not listed in the Constitution. There is nowhere in the U.S. Constitution, I have a copy of this right here, that says that the federal government is supposed to be mandating a smart meter on your home. So such a thing would be left up to the state of California. So let them know this federal law really doesn't imply to us we need to stand up for our own rights.
One quick final comment, and then we're going to go to uh, your questions. Just, just uh, one, one additional point, that uh, if you have your local city or county uh, uh, who's, who's passed a resolution, who's, who's passed an ordinance uh, criminalizing the meters, you'll have a much stronger leg to stand on when you refuse that installer at your home. Okay, we're going we're gonna to transition now to uh, questions from the audience with a microphone. Yes, hi. Um, I'm Frank Hotchkiss with the Santa Barbara City Council, and I wanted to read you a letter that was signed today by three uh, city council members and is going out tomorrow to the head of uh, Southern California Edison. Dear sir, we are writing to request that you immediately halt installation of so-called smart meters anywhere in the city of Santa Barbara. It's only a page long, so let me finish. A number of our constituents have voiced deep concern regarding the meters, including possible dramatic increases in their energy bills and dangerous prol proliferation of radiation affecting health. We would like to ensure there will be no negative results from the installation of these meters, and thus we wish to allay public fears. Please let us know at your earliest possible convenience your willingness to cooperate in this matter. We plan to hold public hearings at which time we hope you or your representatives can appear to testify. So that's going out tomorrow. It doesn't say we're on one side or another. It says we want to examine this more closely. I hope that encourages you. Thank you. Okay, if you want to raise your hand, we'll bring the microphone to you and uh, keep your questions questions and as brief as possible. Hello. And Thank you for being here. I, when I heard Mark talk about Southern California not complaining as much, um, my concern is a lot of people uh, who get insomnia or feel incredibly anxious or their heart palpitations are going to go to their doctor and say, I'm ill. But how are they going to know, unless they know about RF sickness, how are they going to know to call their utility company? How are they going to put that together? So I'd like to have Cindy Sage say a little bit more about what the common symptoms are, um, and then again, I encourage all of you to call uh, your energy company and ask for that number. You're going to need it. If you go, if you go to uh, the report that we published online, uh, just Google up uh, sagereports.com, you'll get. Sorry, if um, if if you go and and, and you Google up sagereports.com. You're going to get a copy of the report that we prepared with lengthy uh, descriptions of symptoms that are common to people who are exposed to radio frequency radiation in a chronic fashion, meaning every day or worse, all night, every night. Um, they include, first and foremost, sleep disruption, the inability to go to sleep, uh, waking up through the night, being hyper alert, feeling like you're on caffeine in the middle of the night for no apparent reason. Most people don't connect that. Secondly, tinnitus or a ringing in the ears, a very high pitched ring. Third, a lot of cardiac problems where people that did have, they had no prior um, uh, problem with um, arrhythmias will, will have arrhythmias, particularly those who have collector meters. And collector meters are the uber meters, the super meters that will pass on the signals from 500 or 1,000 homes. People experience problems with concentration, very serious problems with cognition that actually look like neurological diseases in the early beginnings. They can't think, they can't sleep, they can't focus. Uh, there is a memory and learning component and impairment for this and a behavioral problem in children. This is particularly bad for children. So this is sort of the first constellation. And we are talking about health effects that if prolonged, if this goes on for a long time, can result in inflammatory conditions beginning or reoccurring, chronic inflammatory disease, cancer, and neurological diseases. And if you want to see the evidence, the health evidence on this, I encourage you to look at the bioinitiative report and the smart meter report. We have done a very thorough job of documenting it. So when you go into a hearing and they say, oh, there's no evidence of that, you hold it up and you say, well, there's no proof, you mean. Maybe there's no 100% proof, but the evidence is extremely persuasive and for public health should be a very important factor in the decision 
to have or not have a smart meter. Go ahead. I have a comment and then a question. I'm Michael Self, and because of um, Heather's information, I called Edison into my office first privately, and then with our sustainability committee, and uh, they said they were not going to install these in our area without uh, multiple group meetings, but I understand they are being installed without any of that. And uh, my other comment is that I told them, well, I personally don't have a microwave when they were comparing it, and that I was going to wrap mine in tinfoil. And that really got a buzz out of them because they said it wouldn't transmit. So if you find one. <laughs> and the other thing is I asked them, apparently if you have a solar panels and your now meter will run backwards so you get a credit for that energy generated, that the smart meters do not do that. Is that correct? That's our understanding. Uh, we have a, an offer out to people who, who disagree with that, including the utilities, to say you know, they found smart meters, wireless meters that do allow for solar. We do not think that's the case, certainly not widespread. Um, one thing you need to be very careful with tinfoil, uh, if you wrap it and it doesn't surround the whole meter, it can reflect and concentrate the microwaves into your living area. So just be very, very cautious about that. You might want to get an electro EMF expert out. And I just wanted to make the point that, you know, the, the, the smart meter debacle that we're seeing now, all these people getting sick, it, it is demonstrative of a, of a, a technology industry, of a telecommunications industry that is out of control. And they are seeing dollar signs in their eyes, uh, and they're sacrificing health uh, and in very, very dangerous ways that we know little about. So, um, you know, I think we need to be aware that the Federal Communications Commission's standards uh, are based on, on thermal uh, effects. If, if they, they compare you to uh, essentially a hot dog in a microwave, and they do not consider any non-thermal effects. And now, a month ago, we have this study carried out by the, the most you know, reputable organization, the National Institute of Health, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, saying that cell phones increase uh, brain glucose metabolism, which is a non-thermal impact. And yet our Federal Communications Commission does not consider this. So we have this gap between the evidence and the policy and the regulation, and, and people are really getting caught in the middle. We need to demand action from uh, our, our federal representatives in the FCC on this issue. Someone has a question. I, I have a technical question. Someone mentioned the tinfoil, but are there any uh, technical people here who could answer this question? That is, these uh, transceivers in the smart meter, are they sensitive to strong electromagnetic fields from an outside source like a giant magnet? <laughs> like, like when you put your credit card on the device at, at, at Home Depot, where they undo the uh, anti-theft device, and if you put your credit card there, it erases the data. Uh, I was thinking about something along those lines. Yeah, you know, we're, we, we can't talk a lot about, uh, there are a lot of things that people do to disable these. Um, some of them are gonna backfire, and almost, all of, almost none of them will get rid of all the effects that people worry about for chronic low-level exposure for health reasons. Uh, because the, the, the emissions are still going to travel, the wireless signal will still travel on your electrical wiring like it's an antenna. Your house becomes the antenna. And so, again, you can shield for radio frequency by putting up materials around it on the inside of your walls and so on. You can do the coil. You could even get a, they're illegal here, but if you went to the UK, you could get a cell phone jammer, right? Cell phone jammer. Because you, you're just dealing with cell phone frequencies inside on the two antennas. But I think all of these things are stopgap, expensive, risky, and, and so on. And so um, they're, they sh it shouldn't be our problem to have to do this. Next question. I, I have a question to ponder and then a specific type question. My wife and I have raised five children. I don't know what the rate of autism was when we were raising our children, but I would venture to say that it was probably one in many thousands. Two years ago, it was one in, one in 150. 
Today, it's one in 110. With, I, I don't know how many people can look and say their grandchildren or children four and five years old holding games and playing and hand, being handed a, a cell phone to talk to somebody. What is this doing to the autism rate and what will the autism rate be when everybody has a smart meter? I think that's a question that really needs to be pondered. Second thing, more of a direct question. As I understand it, the power companies charged all of us X amount of dollars and in increases to pay for the smart boxes, smart meters, okay? As a result of the smart meters, tens of thousands, maybe more, I don't know how many people will be laid off because they no longer need a meter reader. This has never been about saving the consumer money. Maybe you're all too nice to say it, but in my little simple brain, I see that it's a win-win situation for the power companies and a lose-lose situation for the consumer. Where do we benefit? We do not benefit at all. You said it. If I may, I would like to answer your first part of the question. I attended last November 18th a, it was called the Wireless Summit at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. They had medical doctors, scientists from various countries in Europe as well as Canada, the United States, Australia, and they also talked about autism. And they said part of the problem they believe is definitely so much exposure to wireless devices. Mothers are using laptops on their children as well as they're expecting their children on their laps, and this is this constant radiation. And as you mentioned, so many little children are being exposed to this early on. France has a ruling now that no child in elementary school can have a cell phone. They're finding out how bad this is for children. They also mentioned the cell phone towers are having a, a real evidently problem, problem on the sperm count of men, that that, that is being lowered. And obviously this must have an effect on a, an expectant mother as well. And my understanding is it's now one out of 90 children now have autism. It's getting much higher, much more rapidly. Really glad you mentioned that. One thing that um, you, you may be wondering is what kind of exposure would you get from a single smart meter, you know, in space if it's somewhere on your wall? Having a smart meter on your wall by our calculations, it's about like living between a few hundred feet and maybe a thousand feet from a cell tower. It is a small cell tower on your property. And if it's on the back garage, it may not affect you too much. But boy, if it's on your house, on your kitchen, on a bedroom wall, it is like a mini cell tower, much more than it's like a cell phone. And that would be intolerable when you think about it. You'd go out and you'd protest a cell tower a half a block from your home because of property values, because of health effects, or whatever reasons. But that is the exposure. And if you're in a condominium or a multifamily dwelling and you're the unfortunate soul to have the whole bank of electric and gas meters on your wall, it is enormously worse. Uh, next Hello. question. The, uh, well, I understand and concur with the issues of uh, privacy, the uh, strange billing practices, failures of the PUC to look after the, the uh, consumer, and the potential for governmental meddling. Second issue is health fear is real, the health hazards are not. There is no such medical diagnosis as electromagnetic hypersensitivity. I, I hear a lot of you talking like witch doctors, you know, we've got this, this magical thing that we need to be afraid of. Okay, the smart meters are a problem. But health issues are not one of them. If you've got peer-reviewed studies, science, I'd like to see that. But there is none. Thank you. I've, I've actually, I have an order of things that I'm trying. I'm sorry. I have Just the question for uh, Supervisor Farrington. Um, a couple of months ago, you came out, uh, Lake County came out against uh, smart meters, and you were talking about uh, seeking an injunction. I wonder if you can give us an update. Have you filed suit? 
And are you working with uh, any of the other 40 cities and counties, maybe networking and filing some kind of uh, class action or something like that? Thank, thank you for the question. The, uh, as, and it's been a quick learning curve for myself, and I appreciate uh, some of the education that I can receive from uh, uh, Josh here and his organization, and then uh, my uh, reading uh, Cindy Sage's reports and having staff and now do an analysis and provide me that information. What we found with these other jurisdictions uh, here in Northern California is that uh, the, the, the PUC has argued under their public uh, resources code that uh, they are exempt. Uh, when I say they are exempt, that the installation of smart meters are exempt under uh, CEQA. And uh, at the state level, they preempt uh, with their powers and authorities uh, any local jurisdiction from interfering with any mandate that they had set forth, i.e., the installation of smart meters. So that had confronted uh, a number of uh, local jurisdictions, um, which is, you know, these are some strange times where you see the state, uh, in my opinion, as being dysfunctional uh, as we look at uh, further slipping down the slope of uh, not being solvent. Uh, you see the state passing the buck, whether it be uh, mandates or unfunded mandates at the local level. Uh, we have a realignment of uh, public safety where we're going to have each local community absorb the supervision of felons, nonviolent felons. Uh, we contend with the IHSS home worker programs. And here's another uh, issue uh, where we're contending with exercising our police powers and trying to implement uh, moratoriums or ordinances exercising those powers uh, where uh, PG&E was before us. They spoke on it. Uh, I brought the item to our board and we acted on it. It was unanimous. And uh, still these uh, meters are being deployed. Uh, so in that vein, understanding that there is no teeth, and if that's the position that the utility companies uh, so desire to take, uh, it's my interest and it's our, been our board uh, to move forward to the next level, which is that of seeking a legal injunction. Uh, we just filed the petition with the PUC uh, as it relates to the recent opt-out proposal, which we think is a plan of extortion. Uh, we address uh, the, the parameters and addresses this, the gentleman here that uh, there may or may not be health concerns that are legitimate. There may be or may not be health impacts. But the problem is we don't know. We don't have that information. And as a leader, you should be informed when you represent your people to make sure that you're armed with that information. It's a precautionary principle that I believe in. And I think in governance, we look over history, whether we allow the government to utilize asbestos, DDT, uh, pharmaceuticals and FDA approval. Uh, generic engineered crops, we can see that the government can drop the ball. It's my job as an elected official to make certain that, that we hold them accountable. In short, the answer is we are reaching out to the other jurisdictions under state law. You know the system's rigged against us at the local level. We have to petition the PUC. We have to exhaust all administrative remedies. And then when we get shot down at the PUC level, then we have to take it to court. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? We can't take it to our uh, superior courts in our home counties or in your county. Uh, we have to take it straight to the appellate court or the Supreme Court to fight this battle. And that's how the system's rigged against you and me. We have time for just two more questions. Excuse, excuse me. Um, I've, got, I've got a pacemaker, and lately, um, by going just by Tucker's Grove, I've been having some issues with my pacemaker. The, the magnetic field is so strong because they have two, to man I think they have three in our towers over there, that my my health, I mean, I, I, I can't go close to that park because I'm reacting to that magnetic field. Um, I spend the day, I've got a monitor on me right now, and I spend the day going around Santa Barbara to certain places where they have um, some dirty electricity poles, and I react to that. This is, yes, there is a health issue, I'm sorry, but people like me and people that don't know they are exposed to those magnetic fields and there is a health issue. Now, if they put a, a smart meter on my house, how am I going to be, I mean, health-wise? They can do that, they can mandate, I believe, isn't it? I mean, where, do, where should I go and what can I do? We, we want to help you answer that question without Edison here tonight to tell us what they intend to do about people who have, particularly who have 
uh, American with Disabilities issues. Uh, there are 20 million people in the U.S. with implants that care very much and that may find difficulty living in their homes like you. It's a very serious problem. We've just given testimony on the issue, and it's unresolved. If I can give a quick comment. Um, see, what's important is for the CPUC to hear uh, complaints, to hear issues of concern just like that. There are two ways you can file a complaint with the CPUC. One is you can go to their website and they have an online complaint form, or you could call 800-649-7570 uh, and ask them to send one to you in the mail if you don't have online access. Um, I, I'm just saying that um, the CPUC, uh, I, I, mean, I mean, each of you is going to decide going from here. You know, there's been a wide range of views um, that, that have been presented here, what, what your own view is. Um, and I just have to say the CPUC is the body that has the jurisdiction over these issues. They, it has been shown that public pressure can uh, move them, so it's up to you. Um, their 800 number is 800-649-7570. So I, I'm just trying to say in terms of concrete action. Uh, next question, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other questions, and our panelists will probably be available if you want to interact with them uh, afterwards. But go ahead, sir. Phil Walker, it's uh, interesting the SoCal Edison rep isn't here tonight, or I'd have a, a bone to pick with this gentleman because he uh, has made my life miserable on several occasions. I'm a 30-year treatment plan operator, and it's interesting to note that we, we have a dedicated 66 kV line, and they're... Uh, field technician who was supervising their grid was not even aware that they had dropped us off grid. Uh, this was just two nights ago. And it made it for a real miserable night. Going back till June 1999 to uh, the turn of the year 2000, I remember FERC, Cal ISO, Enron, Gaming at Melly, and uh, all the good things that came with that. And uh, I had a miserable 52 interruptible shutdowns, restarts of a major treatment facility. And again, my life was extremely miserable. So you can't count on these people when you need them sometimes. And the way I experienced the smart meter uh, problem, I work a late shift and have to sleep in the morning. Okay, I had my gate, gates locked, and it turns out an Edison tech you can't fault the technicians. They're just being, they're just doing what they're told. I look, I look at management and they're uh, taking the ball and running with this. This fellow had to jump the gate and pound on my door, woke me up, and he announced he was removing my, the old meter and putting in a socket to base adapter to set the stage down the road from two to three years, henceforth at that time to uh, facilitate installation of the smart meters. This is over on the east side. I live off the Milpas Corridor. Okay, it turns out there were a lot of fires probably approximately you know, two and a half years ago on South Aliso Street. Fires blowing out big screens, a computer blow it out. And my concern mainly beyond the problems with EMFs and uh, radiation pulses is the older houses are not properly grounded to uh, ground the ground faults potentially caused by the smart meters. And uh, so you the know, question is a, a safety it's a, it's issue. A safety in the wire. issue. You know, I I've survived a, a CVA at work, and I'm a very very fortunate man. But mm. uh, again, the brain and the heart, the cardiovascular system, runs on a 60 hertz cycle. What do the smart meters do? 60 hertz, right? Yeah, jo Joshua a fire, can, uh, a fire will kill you quicker than the other problems. You know, they're long term usually. And uh, my concern is public safety. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Joshua will address well, this. Well, 
the, you know, these meters are definitely not safe in a number of ways. Uh, back in January, we uh, received an email from a former Wellington Energy uh, employee, the company that's contracted with PG&E to install these meters. These are not professionals, although, although the FCC requires them to be. Uh, they are temp workers, paid $20 an hour, and he reported that uh, his manager said on a number of occasions, you could have burned that house down the way that you were installing those meters. In other words, they were, uh, because they are paid on a bonus schedule, they're rewarded for uh, getting in as many meters as possible. So a lot of the meters get installed without, uh, uh, not seated properly in the fixture. And that can create arcing and potentially fires. Now, uh, we did an interview with him. We posted it on our website. You can find it at stopsmartmeters.org. Uh, and what his, his uh, claims were are that this is going to cause a number of fires and could result in another San Bruno. And what we've seen are, is exactly what he said, a number of fires, uh, one in Santa Rosa that was Sorry? There, this needs, these need to be investigated, though. You know, in light of San Bruno, in light of the failure of the utility industry to protect our safety, uh, the, the, these reports need to be investigated and, and safety needs to be put first. There's no excuse. Uh, you, you, uh, As, oh, go ahead. If I could just, you know, it, it may not be a smart meter issue. It may be the fact that when they uh, install these meters, they do what they call a hot swap which is they leave the power on. They don't shut off your power to put in the meter. They leave it on. That's what we believe is part of the problem, is these hot swaps. Well, we, we've got to uh, close this out. I'm sure we could be here uh, all night. We have one last real quick question, and then I'm going curious to, invite, uh, to know go ahead. where the term smart meter came from. <laughs> you don't have to answer that, but I'd like to take this opportunity as a member of the audience to thank Heather Bryden for setting this up, for organizing yes. this. Uh, Mark would like to answer that. Oh. I, I live in Washington, D.C., and um, there's a lot of uh, snake oil salesmen. And, uh, and you can sell your product if you've got a great name. And, and there's people that spend millions of dollars in branding. Corporations do it. But in politics, they do it. And who wants to oppose smart meters, right? Then you're dumb, right? I, so it was a brilliant marketing campaign that ran into problems when the product was defective. Uh, so even the best branding cannot save a flawed product is the lesson to be learned, I guess.